I'm going to be talking about some of the small single board computer systems and Linux-based systems that I've been playing with over the last few years. I, I do a lot of stuff with old, uh, old computers and I uh, do a lot of stuff with gadgets, lots of gadgets, and particularly I've been playing a lot with uh, ARM-based single board computers over the last few years. I'm not really a hacker in the hackery modern kind of way, I might be a bit of a hacker in the old school kind of, you know, this is, uh, uh, I play around with stuff, I like to play with it, see what I can do with it, that may be a little bit beyond what the, uh, was originally intended. So uh, this is a Wikipedia definition of hacker as a hobbyist. So I'm going to be talking about drop boxes, these are the little gadgets, you take them into an organisation that you're wanting to uh, pen test, this is all legit obviously. You stick them on a network and you can use them to gain remote access into the network, you can discover documents, you can discover data, capture it, exfiltrate it, that kind of thing. So the sort of stuff you'll see in a Dropbox, you're going to want some Ethernet, you may have Wi-Fi, 3G, some local storage, but you're definitely going to have tools. I also want to talk just briefly, and I have no idea how I can pause this thing, um, I want to talk about, um, uh, just briefly, about open phones. Because a few years ago, back in 2006, I ordered a, uh, an OpenMoco phone. And uh, this thing is pretty cool. It's, um, it was a completely open source phone. So this was, I think, the very first uh, handset where it was open all the way down to the very core <laughs> of the... There we go, back to the phones to the very core of the system. Uh, it ran a generic Linux kernel um, with just some, some minor tweaks which all got folded back into the main tree. So you could do a lot with it and there were drivers for all sorts of things. So I'm just going to uh, uh, grab my phone out of here so we can have a look at it on the big screen. Now, it's kind of a weird shaped phone, bit of an unusual thing. Can we just swap over to the uh, camera there for a sec? It was, it was a bit unique but Touch screen, little high resolution screen, running the Linux kernel, which meant you can do some kind of interesting things with it. This is what I did with, with mine. You'll see that bolted on the back. Does anyone have any ideas what that might be? Uh, Wi Fi um, adapter. It's, uh, that's an alpha high power Wi Fi adapter. So on the back of this, you can screw in your 8 DVI antenna. And uh, you can hack it old school, like the 90s, all over again. <laughs> so uh, with this, you can just plug it in with a USB cable. You need an external battery as well to drive it. But um, yeah, I thought it would look inconspicuous when I started the project. Not so inconspicuous. If we can go back to the laptop in a second. I'm going to have to go backwards through my slides. I made the mistake of rehearsing my slides, and now it's got all the timings from my rehearsal, and it's also queuing through it. No idea how to stop it. Um, so there's a new project for that phone called GTA 04, which is an open project to develop a new board that swaps the original board, which is quite a very old, it's 400 megahertz um, um, 4T CPU, which means it's really slow, really, really slow. The GTA 04 is a much more modern board, and it's been designed so you can literally just swap out the old board, swap in the GTA 04 board, and it gives you a more modern system. Um, it gives you... Uh, all the stuff you expect on a phone, but it's about uh, 400 euro, so probably not something I, I certainly decided I wasn't, wasn't going to go down that path. Thinking of the drop boxes that I was talking about earlier, there are commercial offerings available. We've got things like the Pony Express, which has been uh, in the news a bit, so you may well know about the Pony Express range already. They range from the Pony Flight Mini, 500 US bucks, a bargain at half the price all the way through to the power phone, 1,500 US bucks and developed with DARPA funding. So um, these are based on the Shiva plug, which is just a generic little Linux system in a power pack. You plug it in and away you go. Um, one of the problems with this is that the power packs come with the US mains plug built into them. And so if you're going to use them in New Zealand, you need an adapter. And if you try to do something inconspicuous, it starts to look pretty conspicuous when it's got a big mains adapter and everything hanging off it as well. There are also things, I noticed uh, somebody mentioned the, um, uh, 
Wi-Fi Pineapple this morning. So this is just a small TP-Link router running OpenWRT. Um, it's got a bunch of uh, tools in it to man in the middle Wi-Fi ports. They're really, really cool, and they're actually quite, quite reasonably priced. So 100 US bucks, you can buy a pre-built Wi-Fi pineapple that does your Wi-Fi man in the middling for you. It's got all the software on board. But it's a pretty limited system, and it's um, developing for OpenWRT. Uh, not being a developer, I found that I just wasn't able to do it at all. I, I really struggled to get any of my own stuff um, built on it. Um, and so it wasn't ideal, really, as the basis for a platform where I wanted to have a wide range of the typical tools that I'd use. Um, there's also the Mini Pona, which is very similar to the uh, Wi-Fi Pineapple, similar hardware. You can buy a kit for 100 US bucks that even comes with a battery, so you can run it off battery. Um, but the same thing, it's running open WRT, it has a slightly better range of um, uh, tools available for it. Sorry? If. Ah, there we go. Alright, um, so yeah, pretty cool, but again, somewhat limited in application. Alright. They're pre-built. That's no fun. I don't know about you guys, but I don't like to buy something off the shelf and then I've got it and I use it, and it's like, you know, where's the excitement in that? That's, nope, the F thing doesn't seem to be working out. Press F every side. Ah. So, um, if you're going to do it yourself, I reckon you should do it on a decent platform. And um, you've probably heard of the ARM CPUs. This is the CPU inside pretty much all the smartphones in the market today. Um, it's the uh, the CPU architecture that's used as the basis for the, um, the A5 and A6 and the, and, and the iPhone. Um, it's a low cost, low power chip that was actually originally designed for desktop systems. So it's quite powerful. Um, uh, you get, get a lot of bang for your buck out of them. And there are single board computers. These are tiny wee single board uh, things like the Raspberry Pi which, um, just switch over briefly. So that's, uh, that's the Raspberry Pi there. Um, they're, a, they're a tiny wee thing. They're based on what's called a system on chip. So that is a, um, a complete, oh, let's do it again. It's pretty much the entire, yeah. Well, it's the entire thing on a PC. So why an ARM SBC? Well, the reason that ARM is a lot better than, than uh, some of those small systems that um, you get uh, with the routers is because they do run a mainstream Linux kernel. There are mainstream distros that actually run on these. You can run a mainstream Debian 6. And with that comes a whole stack of hardware drivers. Um, you get a lot of the tools that are already available for the platform. You've got some fantastic open tool chains for developing on it. And because a lot of these single board computers are designed as development kits, so they're designed for people to experiment with the CPUs and see what they can build out of them, um, they, they're also quite hackable hardware-wise, and they quite often have additional ports on them so you can add your own devices. One of the uses that I thought of was um, perhaps just putting a light sensor onto the device which would mean that if you've got it in an organisation, you know when the lights come on in the morning. You can log it, you can track it, it senses that the light comes on, it senses when the light goes out. You can work out when the cleaners come round and all the lights get, um, get turned on. So the other great thing is open communities. The communities around a lot of these things are fantastic. There are a lot of very active people developing a lot of different things. So half of what you want to do with these systems Somebody else has already done. You can just um, just you know follow in their footsteps. So if you're going to choose a single board computer to play with, the first thing that you will notice is that there are a whole lot of different ARM chipsets, and you'll see things that say this is an ARM 11, and you'll see something that might say it's an ARM 9, and you'll see things that say it's an ARM V7, and you'll see something that says Cortex A8. And it's quite confusing because there's not a lot of consistency. You can see in this table, ARM version 6, which was quite an old architecture, um, 
there are chips that are ARM 11 chips, but those are the ARM version 6 architecture, so they're old, even though the number's bigger. ARM version 7 is the stuff that most of us have um, in our smartphones and so on these days. Uh, the ARM Cortex A8, A9, A15, um, Qualcomm Snapdragon, and here we go again, and the F thing definitely doesn't seem to be working. Um, Exynos, which is the Samsung chip. Um, oh man. Um, the Tegra chips are based on the ARM version 7, and <laughs> this, is, this is really starting to annoy me. And next year we're going to see the AMD Opteron running with the ARM version 8, which is the first 64-bit ARM architecture. So I'm quite excited about that. Don't know about you guys. I'll probably throw a party or something. <laughs> My favourite single board computers, um, one of, the, one of the, the, the first one I played with was one called the Beagle Board. There's now a smaller version of the Beagle Board called the Beagle Bone, which is not quite as powerful and doesn't have quite the same accessories, but is basically the same thing and runs pretty much exactly the same, in fact it runs exactly the same uh, software. You can buy these for a pretty modest price, 150 US dollars for the Beagle Board XM, which is quite a decent spec machine. 89 US dollars for the Beagle Bone. So this pricing is starting to look um, pretty attractive compared to what we saw with some of those commercial pre-built um, devices. You can order this from DigiKey in New Zealand. There's a bit of shipping that goes on top of it. But um, yeah, delivered pretty quickly. Um, the specs on this are quite good. So it's a Texas Instruments CPU in it. It's an ARM CPU. ARM is a company that designs CPUs, but they don't build them. They just license it to other companies to build. So Texas Instruments, uh, one of the companies that built um, ARM CPUs, they built the BeagleBoard as a, um, a demo for their chipset. Um, but it really took off big time with hobbyists. The XM is a 1 gigahertz single core um, Cortex A8. That's a whole lot of processor right there. You can do a lot with that. The Beagle Bone is 720 megahertz, which is still pretty decent, and, and, and it's um, uh, a very capable board. There are a number of distros that you can run on it. Some of my favourites are uh, the Debian project, fully support it, so you can, you can install uh, Debian straight away. Fedora are doing it as well, um, so whichever is your preference, my preference would be for Debian. There's also a great one called the DEC, which is one that is designed specifically for pen testing and is pre-packaged with a whole lot of pen test tools that you can just stick on an SD card, put it in your um, Beagle board, and away you go. So uh, if you're going to go down the Beagle board route, I definitely recommend looking at the DEC. The other big one, which several people have been talking about uh, already, um, I'm sure you all know about is the Raspberry Pi. There's been a lot of um, publicity around the Raspberry Pi uh, since it was announced last year. And um, uh, they're, they're now becoming widely available. And, and originally, they were you'd wait a month or two months for delivery. Now you're going to get it inside a week. Um, 55 bucks delivered, New Zealand dollars. That's value for money. That's really good value for money. Uh, you can order it from Element 14 or uh, what used to be um, Radio Spares, RS Online, uh, and they'll just deliver it to your door. Um, both of them are pretty much exactly the same price, I don't think there's a lot of difference there. The spec on these things is a little bit lower than the Beagle Board and the Beagle Bone. Um, it's an ARM 11 core, which means it's the earlier ARM v6 architecture, so it's not quite as quick, and it's not quite as fast, it's 700 megahertz. Um, though they recently announced that they will um, warranty support um, systems that have been over, uh, that are configured to burst overclock up to a gigahertz, and that makes a huge difference to the performance in their actual use. So when they need the additional uh, CPU, they'll just automatically ramp up to a gigahertz briefly to give you that, that burst, and, and it works very well. Originally released with 256 mega RAM, the new ones are all coming out with 512 because it's exactly the same price as the 256 used to be. Um, the entire, um, one of the basic principles is they wanted to build a small cheap machine and they were targeting 35 US dollars as the, uh, as the price and that's exactly what they've done. Um, so quite impressive. It has 10 100 Ethernet on board, it has USB, um, so it's quite expandable. Um, it was designed to plug into a TV so that it would, 
It was going to be aimed at schools where they probably wouldn't want to, a whole stack of monitors in the classroom. So it's got composite output and it's got HDMI and you can just plug it into any TV to use as a monitor. And the operating system boots off SD card. Distributions that run on the uh, Raspberry Pi, the, uh, the big ones that they support are Raspbian and Debian. Debian and Raspbian are virtually identical. The difference is the standard Debian port uh, doesn't use the hard floating point, the hardware floating point unit. Um, it uses Raspbian is completely customised to the Raspberry Pi and has a, a first boot setup screen where you get to set a lot of things like the um, composite overscan and so on. Excuse me. <laughs> Sorry about that. For our uses as a Dropbox or a pen test tool, you're probably going to want to look at another couple of tool, uh, distros. The first one is Pwn Pi. This one is quite impressive. And I'll go through the tools list on this in a second. You can see just what's already bundled in there for you to play with. The other one actually comes from Pony Express, those guys who do the really expensive pre-built tools. They also do um, the same basic um, OS that they put on their commercial products as a free download for your Raspberry Pi. It's not a distribution in its own right. You do an install of the straight Debian uh, uh, OS and then you boot into that and run the Raspberry Pi configuration tool which downloads, installs, compiles, configures all the tools that they provide. So, Pwn Pi, the first one of those two distros, it has a lot of tools. I don't expect you to read this, but um, you know the headings, it's got information gathering, penetration tools, radio network analysis tools, Privesk tools, uh, reverse engineering tools, stress testing tools, vulnerability identification tools are in there, network mapping, um, tools for maintaining access, which is things like uh, Six Tunnel, Cryptcat, and various others. Um, uh, digital forensics tools are in there, VoIP analysis tools, and um, yeah, I mean, this is the last, the tail end of their list, so it's just phenomenal what they packed in there. Raspberry Pi has a much smaller set of tools in it, but it's still a really, really good set of basic tools that will do you know, most of what you want to do with your, with your box once you start using it. So, putting it together, you start with the Raspberry Pi, you're going to need some kind of source of power. The two options that I've looked at, one of them is the standard wall warp power adapter. But there's another couple of options I looked at. There's battery, obviously, sounds like a, 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 you know, a good thing, be able to run it off battery for a few hours. Um, but the other one, that device at the top there, is actually a power over ethernet splitter. So let's say you want to use this in an organisation. Most middle to larger companies these days are going to be running power over ethernet on their switches. That means you can power your device from the power that's being provided across the network. You don't need an adapter and you don't need a battery. It's not going to have a battery that runs out, so it's going to keep running indefinitely. And these are actually quite cheap. So if we go to the um, camera for a second, what we have there is a um, TP-Link power over Ethernet splitter. It costs me 35 odd dollars delivered. And in one end, you have Ethernet. That end, you have Ethernet goes in. That end, you have Ethernet comes out and power comes out. You can choose 5 volts, 9 volts, or 12 volts. Of course, the Raspberry Pi and most of these boards run off 5 volts. They run off uh, USB-type power supplies. So that works really well. You'll need a, um, an SD card for your operating system. Um, the Raspberry Pi boots off the SD card. It won't boot off a USB flash drive. So um, the, the SD card, choose a fast one, <coughs> class 10 or better, because otherwise you'll be waiting forever for it to boot. And you might want a Wi-Fi adapter or a 3G adapter or something like that to, to help you, you know, exfiltrate, do some network scanning or whatever. You can put all of this together for under 100 Kiwi bucks, and it's all commonly available. <coughs> Excuse me, in a very dry throat. So if you're going to want to, you may well want to start developing some of your own tools or porting tools that aren't already available on the platform. 
that you're you're going for. Now, I'm not a developer, so this is I'm going to go very lightly through this uh, section. The easiest option here is to go native. By native, I mean install a distribution that has the build tools on it, on your Raspberry Pi or your Beagle board or whatever, and just compile it on the device. It's really easy to do, and you know it's going to work when you finish. You're going to have a, a tool that, you know, that, that actually does run on that hardware. But it can be pretty slow. So the next one, uh, next option is emulation. QMU does ARM emulation and it will emulate a lot of the, um, the hardware on, on the single board computers. So here there's a, a link to a, a couple of how-tos on getting QMU up and running emulating a Beagle board or a Raspberry Pi. And then you can use the higher performance of an emulated system on your grunty desktop machine instead of trying to compile it on the you know, um, device itself. So that's a bit of an improvement. The fastest um, way to do it is actually to cross-compile. So that's where you have an Intel-based system or something else, and you configure a toolchain to generate ARM code when you do the compilation. So you'd have an ARM target. There's a fantastic tool if you're going to do this called CrosstoolNG. CrosstoolNG is basically a, a set of scripts that will build and install the, um, the cross-compilation toolchain for you. So when I first started trying to get uh, toolchains set up, it was taking me forever. It was a very slow process, um, and I found it quite, you know, I was going through forum after forum trying to figure out why things don't work. With CrossToolNG, I literally just run a script, and it builds it, and it, it works very, very reliably. And it supports um, both BeagleBoard and Raspberry Pi as targets. So great, great wee tool. Now, that is the end of my talk, but I wanted to just give you a little bit of a look at the, um, the Raspberry Pi itself. So what I have here is a, if we can swap over to camera please. So what we have here is a USB battery. So that just has USB in, USB out. And uh, I think that cost me about $25. You can get them even cheaper than that. That uh, uh, claims to be 2.2 amp hours. The Raspberry Pi draws a fraction of that. You can probably run this for about four or five hours off the battery itself. So the Raspberry Pi, just plug that in there. Takes a standard micro USB uh, power adapter so you can run it off pretty much anything. And now I'm just going to swap the camera over so you might want to pop over to the laptop for a sec. And back onto composite. All right, so what we do now is literally as simple as plugging it in. So this is a uh, an SD card here that I've built up with the Raspberry Poem. And any second now, when I hit that button, we should see it booting. Now, I completely forgot to bring a keyboard with me, so I'm not going to be able to do much of a demo, but I can show you the Raspberry Pi getting all the way through to the login prompt. Which is there we go. So, um, yeah, any questions? The ship's keyboard. That's, a, uh, that's actually a serial terminal. There's no serial on the Raspberry Pi. We thought of that earlier, though. Good suggestion. Yeah. Sorry? What are the... What some of the more fun? Fun balls. Balls. Why? Why some of the cool stuff that you've done with the balls? Some of the some of the stuff that I've done with it. Um. Well, I actually bought um, bought them originally in order to. Um, I'm a, I've mentioned at the start. I'm a big fan of early eight bit home computers. So one of the more fun things, in fact, what I bought my original Beagle board for, 
was to take a ZX Spectrum, which is a tiny wee computer with a wee rubber keyboard, and install the bigger board inside it so I could use it as a, uh, you know, a modern PC looked like a Spectrum. I thought that would be a nice idea. Um, I never got around to doing that because when I started playing around with the Beagle board, I ended up just, um, you know, uh, I, I really just used it as a tiny wee desktop machine. Um, most of the stuff I've been doing really is around, um, I don't really do any uh, pen testing now, but I use, I did a script kidding level type stuff really just as a hobby, walking around with the, uh, the phone and the Wi-Fi adapter and seeing what I can find. Um, uh, there's a lot of potential and there's a huge amount of stuff. People are doing robotics with the Raspberry Pi, uh, all sorts of things. Um, I'm sure I haven't had a lot of time to play with it yet, but I'll definitely be trying out a bit of that stuff as well. Anything else? No, I don't believe so. Um, I don't know that that's even been suggested to them. Interesting idea though. Yeah. Oh, sorry, the question was, um, are the newer Raspberry Pis going to um, do power over Ethernet on board? Um, yeah, one of the tricks with um, power over Ethernet is that you do, actually the device has to negotiate with the switch before it starts supplying power. So um, you do need to have some intelligence in it. It's not as simple as just splitting out you know, power lines from the, uh, from the network. Any other questions? Cool. Well, it looks like despite a complete disaster of a uh, presentation that went off by itself, I've still managed to make it on time. So thank you very much. <laughs>